great uh, session. Very unusual, I think, seeing two very different fields collide and hopefully exchange or <coughs> explode or whatever will happen. Anyway, um, so I'm going to talk about what limits the efficiency of selection and start from the you know, amazing observation that evolution has produced an astonishing diversity of complicated genomes which code for complicated organisms. And there are actually two different issues here, I think. I'll concentrate on the first one, the evolution of large complicated genomes. But then there's the further issue, uh, which is also astonishing, that such a small amount of information, a few you know, million base pairs at most, um, can code for a very, very complicated organism in a very compact way, much more efficiently, <coughs> dare I say it, than computer scientists have managed to code for complicated computers or software. Um, so, just to, you know, give a concrete fact, we, you know, bear in mind the, the size of the human genome, 3 times 10 to the 9 base pairs, maybe not all of it does stuff, maybe a lot of it is just random, we know a lot of it is just the relics of transposable elements and so on, but, you know, at least 10 to the 8 base pairs, probably a good deal more, is maintained by selection. And, of course, we have not just the human genome, we have a lot of other organisms which also do complicated things, have complicated genomes. How do we explain this? And I should say that my talk, in a way, is, I hope, complementary to Les Valiant's talk in the whole session yesterday morning, in that I'll be focusing primarily on explaining the, sorry, where are we? the size of the genome, okay, which at least has the merit of being a number we can measure, that we know how big this number is. I'll also say something about perhaps the number of functional traits which could be maintained by selection. And I actually have no idea what this is. It's some big number, but... Uh, you can each think how many degrees of freedom you think you have. Okay. Um, but neither of those numbers, neither the number of functional traits nor the size of the genome, is the same as the measure of complexity that Les was using yesterday, which was the number of environmental variables or numbers of state variables of the cell which, uh, which are uh, used in a mapping <coughs> to determine some response. Here's f of x, where x is, the dimension, has, is a vector with the dimension that measures complexity. That's something else again. At any rate, um, I should also say that I greatly enjoyed reading your book recently, and what motivated the beginning of the book was this question where I think you quite rightly said that we evolutionary biologists had failed to uh, answer the question of how long should evolution take, and indeed this is a question that's been around a long time, it worried Darwin, one of the most serious objections to the theory of evolution by natural selection, or indeed to the uh, Lyellian theories of uh, geological processes mm. acting slowly mm. over time, was simply that there were good physical arguments at the end of the 19th century that the Earth was only a few million years old. And somehow Darwin thought that just wasn't long enough. And you kind of think that's right. Maybe we did need 4,000 million years to get to where we are today. But it's, you know, we still don't have any a priori way of getting a number for how long should it take to evolve a certain complexity of organism. And that's a hard question. I'm trying to make, in this talk, various sort of back-of-envelope calculations to get at that issue. Now, we have a very good quantitative theory for the rates at which particular changes have happened. If we look back in time, we can say just how these various things happened and how long it should take and so on and so forth. It's a nice example, fairly recently published by Dmitry Petrov's group in Stanford on evolution of insecticide resistance in Drosophila, resistance to organophosphates, depends on three specific amino acid substitutions in the active site, which prevent the, the insecticide binding. Um, and those three specific changes have evolved within you know, 15 years or so, independently, several times. And that seems, you know, really remarkably quick for something so complex, but actually it's not so surprising when you do the calculations, given that a single mutation can give some advantage, a second one a further advantage, a third one a further advantage, so these can build up step by step. And there are a lot of flies out there, so the total number of mutations coming in per generation uh, is really quite large, so actually the time scale is fitting reasonably well with what we know about mutation, population size, and so on. And the same could be said for evolution of quantitative traits. The fact that we're rather well fed <laughs> depends in large part on the success of selection on plants and animals, increasing crop yields steadily year after year, and the rates of those increases we can predict from patterns of genetic variance in the short term. And they're extremely rapid. And there's a nice survey from quite a while back of simply rates of change uh, over different timescales here of 
various morphological traits measured in Darwin's rather unfamiliar unit. A Darwin is uh, one part per million years. Okay, and the basic pattern is simply that if we look at let's say recent domestication, let's say going back to a thousand years, we see rather rapid rates of morphological change. If we select artificially very intensely, we can get even faster changes. But if we go back over long-term records of, let's say, marine sediments, um, looking back in the fossil record, we see slower and slower change. And kind of this, this pattern is obvious uh, and, in a sense, rather trivial, just because if these rapid rates of change had been sustained over a very long period of time, then you know, the, the organisms wouldn't fit on the planet, right? So change has to be slow when averaged over long periods of time. This is simply saying that change can be rapid, but it fluctuates, and so in the long run things stay kind of the same. But this is simply saying that rates of change are potentially much faster than those we observe, and so I think, just to give a bit of history, this question of whether there's been time for evolution has faded into the background because people realise that you know there has been time. We're not struggling to explain the rates of particular events. But there's still, I think, a serious issue about well, what actually limits the rate of evolution overall. Not just asking about particular changes, but asking about the aggregate of all the changes that lead to the evolution of, uh, of a lineage. And I think it's an open question whether the rate of evolution is limited by population genetic factors, mutation, selection, population size, whatever, or by patterns of environmental change, that what matters is the way in which a sequence of environments uh, occurs and moves a po or guides a population towards some novel morphology. Okay, so what I'll do in this talk is just give some very rough back of envelope calculations trying to get at overall rates of evolution and constraints on overall rates of evolution. And I won't be saying anything original, I'm really trying to give a sort of very rapid overview of uh, population and quantitative genetics. But before doing that, I should just say something about the structure of these two fields. That population genetics deals with the frequencies of different genotypes, and we can think of genotypes, roughly speaking, as since it's a computer science institute, a bit string, noughts and ones, a long line. In principle, we need to track the frequency of every possible combination of noughts and ones, every possible genotype. That's an enormously difficult problem. But fortunately, with sexual reproduction, as in fact we heard in, in previous talk, uh, we can make the drastic simplification that the frequency of a genotype is closely approximated in most circumstances by the product of the frequencies of each individual variant at each individual locus. And that turns out to be a remarkably good approximation for outcrossing sexual species. And so we can describe the population in terms of a list of allele frequencies. Okay. I'm kind of waving away a lot of interesting population genetics about the uh, correlations or the so-called linkage disequilibria between sites, but for the purposes of this talk, you know, it'll be hard enough to get anywhere as it is. So we'll just deal with allele frequencies. Now, quantitative genetics, in contrast, deals with complex traits, with phenotypes, with things like height, weight, growth rates, whatever. <coughs> and it deals with them statistically without using any information about the underlying genetics. Because indeed, until recently, we didn't have any information about the underlying genetics. And so the framework is very straightforward. It's almost always a good approximation to treat traits as normally distributed. If we have multiple traits, a multivariate normal. If they're not exactly normally distributed, often a scale transformation or a threshold model or whatever will allow us to get things into this very uh, straightforward statistical framework. And even further than that, we can make a, a very drastic simplification and very often find that what's called the infinitesimal model is a good approximation for trait evolution. So we say that we have two parents, the offspring are normally distributed with a mean of the average of the two parents and with a variance which is essentially fixed, independent of selection. That variance within families may increase due to mutation, it may decrease due to inbreeding, but crucially, it can be approximated as being independent of the process of selection. And it's this framework which actually lies behind practical plant and animal breeding and turns out to be an extremely good approximation to the statistical description of sets of traits. And it can be justified as being the limiting case of a model in which we have very large numbers of genes of small effect and those effects being additive. 
And of course, then you start to get a little bit worried about whether we are actually the sum of effects of each base pair. And that doesn't seem very plausible. I mean, we heard yesterday about you know, actual models of transcriptional regulation and so on, which are highly nonlinear, highly complex. And I think a major open question is what set of actual nonlinear models is also consistent with this infinitesimal? And of course, you could derive the infinitesimal model in. Uh, as a limiting case, provided, in a sense, there isn't too much interaction, too much nonlinearity, and provided the nonlinearity is not directional, not systematic. Can I just ask? Yeah. So, you, by success, you mean on short time, very short time scales? Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. So, over tens, hundreds of generations, exactly. Yeah. But in a sense, a lot of the constraints I'll talk about can be thought of as short time scale constraints about rates of, uh, of accumulation of information mm -hmm. under selection. Okay. So just to illustrate the success of the infinitesimal and you know, give an idea of the timescales I'm talking about, this is a, a neat um, survey of a whole variety of selection experiments from a paper by Weber and Diggins. It's probably rather obscure. It's famous mostly for the invention of the inebriometer. Okay? And this was a major advance, technical advance in Drosophila uh, selection experiments, because before that people had selected on traits they could count by hand. And so, you know, even if you had the most dedicated PhD student, they would be driven mad by doing selection experiments of you know, more than a few you know, tens of generations with more than a few hundred individuals. It just, yeah, physically counting the individuals was, was a bottleneck. So Weber intro introduced various schemes for running selection experiments on a large scale. And the inebriometer was a, a neat device, which was a kind of distillation column in which there was a light at the top. There was an increase in concentration of ethanol vapor. The flies came in, they flew towards the light. They fell over drunk, and they were kind of distilled off to the side. And you could fractionate the flies according to their resistance to alcohol, right? Hence the inebriometer. <laughs> so he did various experiments like this. He had a wind tunnel where the flies were trying to fly up against the wind and so on. And, and it was really very interesting, because if you selected on bigger and bigger populations, you got a larger and larger response. Typically, you select on any trait in any population, you'll get a pretty rapid response of some fraction of a standard deviation, reflecting some substantial genetic component of variability. Um, and that will continue, but in a small population, the variation will be exhausted. In a larger population, you'll be able to go further before the variation is exhausted. And there's a very definite prediction from the infinitesimal model, which goes back to Alan Robertson in the 70s, um, which says that in the long run, in a population size uh, NE, effective size NE, the total response will be 2NE times the initial response in the first generation. So a population size of 500, you'll be able to get a response 1,000 times that in the first generation. Simply an issue of how long it takes for variation to be eliminated by random sampling. And there's also a prediction for uh, the response after 50 generations. And so this plot here is a ratio of response after 50 generations relative to the first generation. Uh, these are the predictions from the infinitesimal model as a function of population size with and without mutation doesn't make very much difference for plausible values of mutation. And these are the observations which come from a whole range of different experiments on mice and maize and drosophila and so on. And it's kind of you know, remarkable to me that these fit just below these predictions. Response is a little bit less than you might expect because selection is eliminating variation as well as random drift. But to a pretty good approximation, you know, given the, the, the inaccuracies in all of these sort of experiments and all the assumptions we're making, this very simple infinitesimal model gives a reasonable prediction to the response to selection over these timescales of here, 50 generations. So, Nick, I guess this curve looks as if it's logarithmic in N. Well, so it's actually pretty easy to understand it. So there's a maximum limit here. If the population size is infinitely large, then you just carry on going, right? So this is just 50, right? That's the upper limit. Here, we have this limit 2NE, but this is a log scale here, right? And therefore, it curves exponentially upwards. So it's just a function of having a log scale on here. No, but, I, but you said that the result was that it's linear in any. You meant that the result was that it's logarithmic in any. No, the no, 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 no. The theory is that if you go an infinitely uh, far out, then the ultimate response is here 2NE times the initial response. That is 2NE given that this is a log scale and this is a linear scale. So it looks exponential because I've changed this to a, linear, to a log scale. So that's 2NE here, and this is 50, and it's an interpolation between those. That's all. OK, so, so we have this sort of nice model for quantitative genetics, which seems to be locally accurate, accurate in the short time scale, even though we know that the mapping between traits and genotype, some arbitrary function, uh, traits are an arbitrary function of the uh, genotype, that's very, very complex. 
but we can still get somewhere. OK, so back to the question I started with. What limits the efficiency of selection? And this question had been asked primarily by using various kinds of load arguments. And these go back to the 1930s, I suppose, originally. Um, genetic load being defined as the loss of fitness relative to some ideal value, some maximal value. And the idea is that if we can show that various processes of selection lead to a loss of average fitness, then we can use the fact that organisms have some maximum reproductive rate to set a bound on how much selection can be acting. And kind of results uh, that one gets are really quite nice results. They're independent of the actual nature and strength of selection. Results, uh, which is the first one, I guess, from Haldane, uh, showing that the loss of mean fitness due to mutation, due to deleterious mutations across the whole genome, uh, is just of order total mutation rate, independent of selection. And the way to think about this is to see that every bad mutation that comes in has to be eliminated by a so-called selective death, by a failure to reproduce uh, or survive. And hence, rather generally, we have this mutation load result of order total mutation rate. Result which was mentioned in the previous talk uh, from Haldane, so called cost of selection or so called substitution load, saying that the total number of selective deaths, total loss of mean fitness per capita, is of order log of one over the initial frequency of some variant. We could think of a single variant uh, which is being pulled up from, let's say, 10 to minus 6 up to 1, and then you have of order, there's some factor in front here, but of order log 10 to the 6 is the total loss of mean fitness summed over the whole period in which you're trying to get from low frequency to high frequency. This is the loss relative to some ideal situation in which instead of using slow, inefficient natural selection, which takes time, you suddenly fixed the best genotype available for the circumstances. And then there's also somewhat less well-known so-called drift load introduced by Kimura and Ota in 1970, which also applies uh, to both polymorphisms and two quantitative traits. In both cases, we think of the loss of mean fitness due to the fact that in a finite population, we have fluctuations away from the equilibrium value. And that will generally lead to a reduction in mean fitness of order one over four times population size. Okay. So this is also imposing a constraint on the numbers of polymorphisms that could be maintained at a particular frequency or the number of traits which can be maintained at a particular optimum. And all of these seem to set some fairly strong constraint on how much selection can be going on. And as was mentioned before, um, the substitution load, for example, suggests that the rate of substitution cannot be more than, let's say, 1 in 30 or 1 in 100 per generation. And indeed, Kimura, uh, in this rather nice paper, I can't now ask some confusion, was it 1960 or 61? Anyway, around then. Um, he actually calculated that the number of bits of information accumulated, that is the net improbability measured like this, uh, accumulated since the Cambrian along the vertebrate lineage was about 10 to the 8, which miraculously is about the size of the functional genome. And these load arguments had played a very prominent role in the 1970s in the argument between Kimura and others promoting the neutral theory, who argued that these load arguments put a strong cap on how much selection could be going on and said essentially that all this variation that was being revealed, all of these substitutions being revealed in comparison between species, most of this had to be neutral. There wasn't enough selection to go round to explain these in an adaptive way. And there was a very strong counter-argument which pointed out that these constraints all become much weaker when genes interact and it essentially can be broken. So there's plenty of selection available and I think the consensus now would be that a remarkably large fraction of molecular variation is affected by selection. Okay. So let's go through these arguments about what happens when we have gene interaction. And the sort of agenda I have here is sort of maybe to, to try and see if computer science could be some use. Um, this is some radical thought for <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean the, the sort of my you know, very rough caricature of population genetics will be that it's very good at calculating rates of particular processes under particular models. If you tell me the types in a population and what their relative fitnesses are, I can say what's going to happen. I mean, it's just bookkeeping. There's nothing fancy there. But it's very difficult to get results which are general in the sense that they apply to any map between fitness and genotype or between trait and genotype. And of course, we know that's a complicated mapping. Um, 
And yet we're forced to rely on models like the infinitesimal model in quantitative genetics, which kind of work somehow, but we don't quite know why they work. And we really like to have a better way, a more systematic way of understanding the, the way evolution works when we have some arbitrary relationship, some very broad, undefined relationship between phenotype and genotype, between fitness and genotype. Okay. So let's think about mutation load, which may be the simplest thing to think about. If we have asexual reproduction, and if we suppose that there's a best type, which has some fitness, has some number of offspring per generation, going back to yesterday, I'm just taking fitness here to be a very boring quantity, the number of copies of an individual or a gene left per generation, so you need discrete time to keep things simple. So with asexual reproduction, we have this fit individual producing offspring, but if we have deleterious mutations, perhaps most of its offspring will be different. We'll have one or more deleterious mutations. And if we assume mutations are always taking you downhill, which is a good approximation, then only a small fraction of offspring will have the same genotype. And so the effective number of offspring produced is its actual reproductive output W times, uh, sorry, there's a mistake here. Oh. It's only a minus one, that's why. Okay. Would have been worse if it was a square root of minus one. But anyway. No! <laughs> no! No! Get rid of that thing. Okay. Uh, it was a mutation. It was a mutation, that's it. it was, and mutations are always deleterious, as yes. we know, yes. Okay, so you basically find that the actual fitness of the fittest type times the probability of producing an identical offspring which if we assume a Poisson distribution of mutations, total rate big U, that is W times E to the minus U, that has to equal the average fitness of the whole population, which in the long run will be around one. And so that sort of very simple argument tells you that the, uh, the ratio, no, I haven't got it, it was nice in the first time. Why do I, yeah. Since you, you keep changing the argument anyway by, yeah. by changing the sign there. So please, <laughs> <laughs> just keep it well, up and apply evolution to it. That's right. <laughs> we'll see that. <laughs> or I can have a quantum superposition and then I can move into the other session, yeah. right? But it's, but it's a simple argument, but it's also yeah. a wrong argument. Right? Yeah, I'm going to say why it's wrong in a minute, right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm allowed to have false arguments and then correct arguments, maybe. Maybe I'll mostly have false arguments. Okay, so this is a very simple argument, which is based on asexual reproduction, on unidirectional mutation, and it says that, you know, regardless of the details of how fitness is determined by the genotype, Fitness is going to be reduced by a quantity that depends on the total rate of deleterious mutation. And that that's, looks bad for us. I mean, if we apply it to humans, then we say, well, we've got sexual reproduction, but this should still apply if we could make the assumption that fitness effects of different mutations multiply together. In that uh, world, a multiplicative effect, then this still applies, and we have a substantial loss of... Uh, fitness. I mean, we, we're now getting to know what the total deleterious mutation rate is, although in the first workshop of this session, there's a nice talk by Molly Pachorsky, who actually showed that we didn't know as much as we thought we did, and there was a big range in the estimates, but they seem to be pretty high. Total rate of mutation per diploid human genome may be 60 or so. Of course, most of those may be more or less neutral, but if we look at those sections of genome which seem to be conserved, seem to be evolving slower than neutrally, we get a total deleterious mutation rate, which is worryingly high. We should have a substantial loss of reproductive capacity uh, due to deleterious mutation. Of course we do, there's substantial load due to genetic disease, but these figures are suggesting that maybe we, we're, you know, we should be worse off than we actually are. Okay, so how do we get out of this? Well, it turns out that in a sexual population, the number of uh, bad mutations can be substantially less than predicted by these simple-minded arguments if genes interact in the right way. And there's a simple graphical uh, way to see this. Suppose we plot the log of the mean fitness against the uh, average number of deleterious mutations in the population. The equilibrium is one between mutation putting deleterious mutations in, selection eliminating them, and selection is given by the slope of the relation between log mean fitness and numbers of deleterious mutations. What matters is the marginal effect of increasing the number of deleterious mutations by one. If the relationship is multiplicative, giving a straight line on this log scale, then we can use simple geometry to see that the height here is just equal to the total deleterious mutation rate. Just from the fact that the slope of this line is s and this here is u over s, so this is u, geometry. 
And so, in other words, if we extrapolate from the numbers of deleterious mutations here and their marginal effect in this population, we predict that the fittest individual should be incredibly fit, should be someone who's producing, you know, 200 children per generation. That doesn't seem possible for humans. Um, it's an interesting thought experiment, but we could probably do this nowadays. I mean, all you do is, not, not for humans, say, but for yeast or flies, let's say, we just put at each site the consensus allele. And that would normally be the fitter allele, okay, if we have a simple mutation selection model. The question is just, what would that organism look like? And the prediction is that if effects are multiplicative, it will be ridiculously fit. And the point is that if we have this kind of pattern of negative epistasis, of downward curvature, of accelerating deleterious effects as we get more and more uh, bad mutations, then you can have a strong marginal effect, but a small cumulative effect if we take it out to there. So it's simply an issue of extrapolation here. Importantly, it's not anything to do with patterns of epistasis within this population. It's really about what we're predicting about the perfect organism. Is that an absurdly uh, fit organism? So one way to look at the failure of this kind of load argument is to say that, well, we should only really make arguments about relative fitness, about comparisons between actual organisms we can actually see and measure. Because at least at the moment, at least without a lot of money, we can't construct this perfect organism. And so what matters is... So, yeah. It seems to me those two formulations are not the same. I mean, in one case, you construct... In both cases, you construct a perfect organism and you find that it's not absurdly mm. fit. Mm. But if it's all about relative fitness, you construct the perfect organism and the nearly perfect organism mm. and you still have plenty of fitness difference between them, whereas the formulation you've got th there, those two would have almost equivalent fitness even if they were the only two competing against each other and not to all the unfit normal members of the population. Yeah, I think we, it's probably a bit of a sideline this because there is, the question is whether there are two distinct issues or one failure, yeah, which are two sides of the same coin. <laughs> and I'm not sure about that. I mean, so, I mean, the point you're raising is that there may well be a lot of variation in fitness, which is due to competition, due to sexual selection, due to things that aren't, if you like, concrete physical constraints. It's a matter of relative competition between individuals in the population. I think, you know, whether or not that's important, or whether it's an issue of epistasis, I guess, yeah, I'll agree with you, actually. Yeah, it's, they're distinct issues. But either way, what we should do is simply ask about variation in fitness in this population, because that's what's driving the process, OK? It may be competitive, it may not be. Um, so if we take you know, that line, we look for something observable that we can use to settle limit. And I would say that the best measure is the variance in fitness. Okay? And here, the variance in fitness is just total mutation rate times the average selection coefficient, which actually turns out to equal, as a result of Fisher's fundamental theorem, um, it equals the rate of decline in fitness due to mutation. Fisher showed very elegantly that the increase in mean fitness due to selection on allele frequencies is precisely equal to the variance in fitness, uh, which is a quantity that must be limited by reproductive capacity. And in this mutation selection balance model, that must equal, must be offset by the decline in fitness due to mutation. So, that quantity, even if u is bigger than 2, if s is, you know, 1% or so, this will only be of the order of a few percent. Indeed, there are a few measurements of the rate of decline in the absence of selection in mean fitness. Uh, there's Alex Kondrashoff's famous middle-class neighbourhood experiment where he sort of had the idea that, you know, you bring up flies in a perfect world where they all have two children and they all go to school and so on and whatever. Um, you, you remove selection. And then he showed that selection sort of declined at some rather slow, difficult-to-measure rate. At any rate, this, this is clearly not a strong constraint on how much selection there can be. We could, under this view, have quite a bit more mutation. We could have bigger genomes if we could uh, manage it. Okay. So... Similar sort of issues with substitution load. We have apparently a very strong general argument. Uh, this is really a, a sort of generalization of the Haldane argument, I'll get back. Um, which is true for asexuals. It's true with sexual reproduction and multiplicative fitnesses. We just say that the frequency of some type is equal to its initial frequency times the ratio between its fitness and the average fitness in the population multiplied <coughs> over generations. We take logs. We find that the log of the ratio between the allele frequencies at the end and the beginning is just equal to the sum of this measure, which is a kind of measure of the total uh, log ratio between the maximum reproductive capacity and the mean. And this, again, is limited by reproductive capacity. But again, we can evade this load. We can see this 
uh, rather easily if we think of a sexual population, we simply think of how we would select most efficiently for the good alleles. We have a whole lot of good alleles, all very rare. We choose the best fraction, theta, 10%, say, of the population. And if we can detect those alleles, the best ones, as long as they're sufficiently rare, will all be in the top 10%. Top 10%. So these alleles, I'm imagining hundreds and hundreds of alleles, all at very low frequency. If we apply this perfect truncation selection, we'll be able to increase each one by a ratio, 1 over theta, per generation. Okay? So we'll pretty quickly get all of them to high frequency. And in fact, we can have almost any number getting to high frequency. Once they're at high frequency, if we don't have recombination, we can't bring them together and there'll be a kind of traffic jam. Uh, asexuality leads to this problem of competition between different favorable alleles. But with recombination, we quickly bring them together, we quickly get to fixation. And this, one can show, is, is much more efficient. And substitutions uh, of weakly selected alleles um, can occur in very large numbers without imposing a very large variance in fitness within the population. So if we take variance in fitness as our measure, uh, our constraint on total reproductive variability within the population, we can see that we could have a very large rate of substitution, lambda, if s were sufficiently small. If we push the selection coefficient small enough, we find that selection becomes ineffective when ns is of order 1 or smaller. And so we might expect, roughly, that uh, we would maximize the rate of substitution if we had ns rather small. And I'll come back to this argument at the end, which I hope will be soon. Right? I expect you hope will be soon. <laughs> so finally, drift load. And we have here a very beautiful result that goes way back to the 1930s to Sewell Wright. Um, I wouldn't say Wright derived it, he produced it. The, the, uh, <laughs> the formula emerged, and it was later justified rigorously using diffusions and so on, but Wright simply could see somehow uh, that this formula. A rather general formula for the distribution of allele frequencies, provided we have linkage equilibrium, provided we have recombination fast enough relative to selection. And it's a very simple form. I've given it in the simple case with two alleles, frequencies pi and qi at locus i, mutation rates mu i and nu i in opposite directions. We have this part, which reflects the distribution under mutation and drift, the neutral distribution. And we have this part, which is encapsulating all of the effects of selection. And crucially, this applies whatever the pattern, the relationship between fitness and genotype. We can have arbitrary epistasis. So this is one of the very few results that is kind of independent of the genotype-phenotype relationship. And we can go further and say, if selection is acting on a set of traits, some very large number of traits, which are distributed, let's say they're normally distributed, although I won't yet need to make that assumption, we just average over the allele frequency conditional on those traits, and we find that we have now the distribution of the mean and the variance, or the mean and the covariance of a set of traits, is again a product of the distribution they would have under neutrality, which I'll assume is rather flat with respect to the mean, that you know, there aren't any strong genetic constraints, so you have to have these traits or these traits. But then we have this, which is expressing the whole effect of selection on those traits. Selection on the mean and the variance. So if we focus on uh, the mean of a single trait, just to give some sort of back of envelope idea of what's going on, and look at the distribution of that trait around some optimum at zero, you find rather easily that the uh, mean fitness is reduced by 1 over 4n. That's where the simple drift load argument came from. But again, we can say, well, we don't really believe that we can compare the ideal organism, which doesn't actually exist, with the average organism, which will deviate from the optimum at one of you know, many, many traits. So we say we're interested in the variance in fitness. And if you use the same argument to get at the variance in fitness, you find it's 1 over 8n squared, and that's a much weaker constraint. You might sort of say, well, we're prepared to have a variance of fitness of order 1, so that now the number of traits we can maintain independently near a particular optimum is of order n squared, which is a much bigger number than n. I suppose to computer scientists, it's all polynomial, <laughs> so what do we care? <laughs> but, we try and be more precise in evolution. OK, so finally, a very interesting result, which has sort of emerged rather recently, which goes back to the same kind of arguments I was making rather roughly for substitution load. And this is a paper by Mustonen and Lassig, PNAS, um, which actually picks up on a, uh, a very general result from non-equilibrium thermodynamics by Yazinski. And I'm actually, I don't know whether I'm encouraged or depressed that you know, physicists, who are very clever people, took a long time to get to this very general result, which is, um, you know, I think, quite a dramatic generalization of equilibrium thermodynamics. 
So, this is what it looks like. If we take a population which starts in some arbitrary distribution, I should say an ensemble of population starting in some arbitrary initial state, we let it evolve to some other state under selection, mutation, drift, whatever, and we then calculate the expectation of this quantity, it's always equal to one. Okay? So that seems remarkably general. What are these two things? Well, this phi is what was stolen and Lassig called the fitness flux. And it's simply this sum of the products of the selection coefficient on an allele <coughs> times the change in that allele's frequency. So if you like, it's analogous to work. It's the force times the response. It's the selection pressure times the response to that selection. And so this actually has a rather tangible meaning. If we thought of a series of substitutions at separate loci going from 0 to 1, this would be simply the sum of the selection coefficients over time. But crucially, phi can be generally positive, even if the population in the long run is in a kind of stationary state, because we can have a fixation of one allele under positive selection. Selection can then change. We are allowing changes in selection. Go back, go up. And each of those changes, if they are a genuine response to selection, will give a positive fitness flux. Then H is simply this measure of improbability we've seen before in the kimura haldane argument, but is now at the level of an ensemble of populations, and it's giving us the basically the log of the relative probability that the population will be in its current state relative to uh, the neutral stationary reference state. And so it's a measure of the improbability of the final state. And this is saying something about the trade-off between the strength of selection pushing the population into a certain small region of sequence space and that response, that compression of the probability distribution into a smaller region. So it's a kind of information measure, I guess. And this leads immediately to an inequality which says that the fitness flux times the population size provides an upper bound to uh, the increase in information, the increase in improbability, if you like. So the difficulty is to interpret what this means, because although I said the fitness flux is kind of in principle measurable, um, it's not clear that it provides a constraint. But I only have a sort of sketch of a, an interpretation here, which is to say, well, let's suppose that the change in allele frequency, or the rate of change, is a component due to selection, SPQ, plus other stuff, and say that this other stuff will tend, if anything, to be either neutral or to act in opposition to selection. And this is, goes back to Fisher's idea that this component, which he identified as, in fact, the variance in fitness, is counterbalanced by generally negative components, declines in fitness, due to other stuff which are random with respect to adaptation. And so we have the idea that perhaps the total variance in fitness times population size provides a bound on the total information gain. So that's a kind of neat um, constraint. It's actually an extremely loose constraint, because if this is of order you know, one per generation, if we had a really intense uh, process of selection, we've now got a population size in here. So it's a much, much uh, looser constraint than Kimura's original result, which was um, of order 2n, in fact, 2n different. And so this says that potentially sexual reproduction um, combined with uh, the right kind of gene interactions could allow a much faster accumulation of information. So to summarize all that, we have population genetics, which is kind of tedious, but will explain anything if you tell me the input, but of course we don't know what the input is. We have quantitative genetics, which kind of by magic gives a statistical and rather accurate description of short-term evolution. Even the very, very, very simple infinitesimal model, which is consistent with a, a bizarrely simple additive model, is remarkably accurate. And if we use this machinery, we get various kinds of load arguments which appear to produce strong constraints if we assume multiplicative effects, if we ignore gene interactions. If genes interact in the right way, then these constraints are drastically relaxed and we have abundant possibilities of selection to produce complex organisms. But this, of course, leads to a question which really Joanna talked about yesterday um, and which will probably come up again, which is why should genes interact in this way? Why should we evolve to this sort of state in which um, we can sustain a high mutation load, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and these, I think, are, are quite difficult questions. So I shall stop the talk there. <laughs>